Welcome to Lafayette Church of Christ. We're so glad that you're here and so glad that we have visitors as well. And you survived until the last day of 2023. How nice. And if you want to keep talking, go ahead. But I'm, the next sermon will be about you. I'll give you a chance to find you a seat. There's plenty of good seats up front. You can see me better. That's not a not a deal breaker for you. And notice Miss Chloe's with us today. Yeah. We're gonna keep her all year. The rest of this year, we got it. <laughs> I'm trying to talk them into saying for next year too. I don't know. If you help me, we might can keep them. We'd love to keep them. Any be careful what I ask for. I know her. I know him. We're good. And I'll tell you the truth. Anybody that comes, anybody that visits here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about staying here. It's just the way it is. Because I believe it's the best place to be. I'm bragging. <laughs> I think it's the best place to be. Good. We've got eight men over here. We're studying the book of James, so be turning to James. And um, hopefully you have your questions. If you don't, I'll try to arrange to get you some. We'll be on page uh, two of our question um, of our uh, actual notes, and on letter B, we'll begin there in just a minute. So, before we begin into our study, let's go to our great God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for the great blessings you give to us. Father, there's so many things that you do for us and so many things that you built into life and living that sometimes we take for granted. And our Father, we want to be closer in love with you and, and closer to you by studying your word and understanding the things you have done for us. Our Father, we stand amazed at the things that you have done, the things you are doing, the things you will do for those who love you. We pray, our Father, that we continue to grow closer to each other in love and that we concentrate our thoughts and our our very uh, emotions on setting your will and accomplishing your will and to love every day that you give us to live. Our Father, we are facing a new year and we pray that we will accomplish things in the new year that need to be done and that we try to put 2023 behind us and to look forward to this new time of opportunity. Our Father, thank you also for this word, great word you've given us and help us to understand what you've given to us Help us to gain the lessons that we should and to be a better people for it and try to help others also to be interested in, in you and to understand that we're all judgment bound. In the name of Christ do we pray. Amen. I have a, I have a sister that I, I tell you all the time about her. If she ever shows up, you'll know it because I'll, I'll probably cry. But um, I, I tried yesterday. We had a gathering yesterday. I tried to get her to just commit to coming, you know. And... Um, she just, I don't do it. I don't know why. I don't know. Um, but if you see me bringing somebody tied up and handcuffs and all that stuff, it's my sister. Get her here somehow. She's stubborn. I don't know where she gets it from, but she's stubborn. Miss Loretta, how are you doing? Better? Is that better? Okay. I'm glad that you're doing better. Miss Loretta had some difficulty last Wednesday when we were here. Hopefully she's better. And your arms better? All right. Well, Mr. Red, we, we got you in our minds and, you know, we're thinking about you. So. Let's go to the book of James and we're looking at James chapter 1 and we're into uh, verses 12 through 18. If you look at letter B, I have right there uh, for the scripture, chapter 1, verse 3, but that's incorrect. Can you believe it? I made a mistake. So that's actually 13. So if you want to adjust that, put a 1 in front of that 3, that's actually chapter 1, verse 13. That's on letter B under letter of Roman numeral 3 on page 2. And I try to proofread these and try to do it as I go. And I, But then when I go back and study it, I'll look and I'll go, oh, I made another mistake. But hopefully nothing, nothing major, nothing worse than that. So um, whenever we have these temptations, things that come to us in life, 
And everybody, by the way, is tempted by something. Now, it may not be the same thing, and the things that tempt me may not be the same things that tempt you because you may not like chocolate cake, you know? Oh, red does. Her hand went up immediately. But, you know, and just speaking more in a more serious state, it's not just food, but we're talking about things that would involve us going into sin. And there are some things, because, see, desire is okay, but it's what kind of desire is it, and can that desire uh, turn into something that is an evil desire? You see what I'm saying? So we, there are things that are built in us that are just fine. Those, there's physical things that are built in us, those desires, those are fine in the right place. But if we take those out of that and put them in another place or let that desire lead us into do something evil, something that is against God, then we have abused the gift that God has given us. We have abused that thing, that desire that God has given to us because He's given us rules about certain things. There are sexual temptations. There are other physical temptations, sensual te temptations. But it may also be um, that, that desire for money turns into a sinful thing, and I can uh, pursue things that would bring me money and fame and glory when instead I be, should, should be pursuing the glory that God deserves. So there's a lot of things that can be involved here. And James is, remember, writing to the people who have been scattered from their homeland. And I keep reminding you that when you're scattered from your home away from the people that are kind of your anchor, it's sometimes easy to lose your focus on God. Um, when our young ones go off to college, we pray for them because we know what can happen when they go to college, who they can get around and maybe be influenced to be led away from God. And so it's always good that as soon as we can teach our children from the very time they're born to start, start teaching them about God. Here's what Hebrew mothers, Hebrew parents would do. Uh, and in fact, Jewish parents today will do the same thing. They are taught, you come from God, you belong to God, you're going to serve God, you'll go back to God. This is what they teach them from the time they're born. What about that? They also add in there, you're Hebrew, you know, but, um, but why couldn't we do this, right? I used to think that children couldn't, um, I couldn't really uh, make children responsible to learn things. My son, at a very young age, learned baseball cards. You know what those are? Baseball cards. And if I said, Barry Bonds, he could say, oh yeah, here's his, um, I don't know the stats, it's an ERA, uh, you know, and all the all runs batted in and all that. He, he would know all that stuff about Barry Bonds. I'm thinking, oh, if you can do that, you can learn the books of the Bible. Right? And he did. And uh, so, you know, it's just, a, you have to realize that children are able to accomplish a lot more than you think. And if you start teaching and showing them that we belong to God and we want to go back to God, that's what they'll grow up with and that'll stay in their minds. I promise you, that's the way it is. It doesn't mean, you know, like the proverb would say, train up a child in the way he should go and what? He will not depart from it. Now that sounds like an absolute, but, but we know it's not. Because there's evil influences in the world. But when we do everything that we can do, the odds are, the chances are, our children will go the way that they should. It doesn't mean it's the same in every case because, like I said, your children can get around, like I did when I was younger, you can get around evil influences and be led that way. So it takes a while to get through to your children, but if you can show them the way of God and demonstrate it, it really, I think sometimes that's a more teachable thing than maybe just saying it. Let them catch you doing it, you know. Take them visiting with you or something like that. But let's go back. So our temptations can't be charged to God either. A temptation to do evil is one thing. A testing of your faith is another. God will test your faith. We, we proved that with Abraham. But He's not going to tempt you to do sin because there's no sin in God. Now, I'm going back to the text here. I'm actually looking at the Bible here. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted that is tempted to do sin, I am tempted by God. Because God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does He Himself tempt anyone. So don't blame God with it. And don't say, well, God put this desire in me, I was built this way, so this is the way I have to go. And God's at fault. No, that's wrong. There's no sin in God. There's no sin associated with God. And God doesn't live where sin is. And neither 
is any sin going to heaven? All right, so we've got to understand God is separate. That's why He's called holy. Holy is to be separated, to be sanctified. All right, so that's what we're supposed to be. We have a problem, though. See, we're human. We're in the flesh. And things do come to us. Things do tempt us. And do we sometimes give in to them? Yes. Which is another reason we love our great God is because He's loving enough to also take us back when we're willing to repent. Isn't that great? So, as we're looking at these things that happen to us, remember, He doesn't tempt anybody with evil. He's not tempted by it. But what do we do with these desires? Self-control. Self-control. Remember, life is a test. It's not supposed to be utopia. What if this life was free from any injury, any disease, any difficulties whatsoever? You didn't have to worry about anything. Didn't have to be on guard about anything. Don't have to worry about security. Would you want to go to heaven? And so this life, to me, with all its troubles in it, that's fine. I understand that life is not fair. But with all the troubles and stuff in it, it just keeps making me look toward a place where there is no difficulty. A place where God is. I can't imagine. I want to imagine this, but I can't imagine what it's going to be like. And I don't know if I would even lift my eyes to see the one who created me. What a humbling thing. The one who created us. Why did he create us? That's another good question. Out of love, He creates us, gives us free volition, but there's the ability to make choices and to let us move freely and do the things we want to do, but also instructs us on who He is and how much He loves us and how much He wants us to live with Him. I can't imagine lifting my eyes to see heaven and to see our great Creator, Sustainer, and then the one who died for me. That's going to be. That's as humbling as I, a thing as I can think about. Because I know my life. You know yours too, don't you? Everybody has a past. Isn't it one of the wonderful things to think about, and it, again, hard to fathom, with my past and your past, God's willing to forgive all that. And it won't come up in judgment. Oh, I am so glad for that. God is separate from evil. Keep that in mind. It is not God that is doing things like that. If you lose a loved one, don't ever say, why did God take them? There's a, a place, I just read it the other day, I was reading, um, and I think it was in Isaiah, and God says, do I have pleasure in those who die? That was the question he asked. Do you think that I have pleasure in people dying? Now the scriptures tell us that blessed are they who die in the Lord, right, in Revelation, and from now on, because they have rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So precious in the sight of the Lord is whenever the righteous die because they're taken care of. But God does not want people to die outside of Christ. He doesn't want people to get lost. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. He's not willing that any should perish. All right, we understand. So God is separate from evil. Now notice, when He is tried... We looked at that last week. When He is tried, so the trying of our faith, those things that we're having to endure, if we endure them faithfully, it makes us more mature. It gives us a, a more pure faith. Not perfection, but it helps us to get stronger. It fortifies our faith is what it does. So I gave you some examples here. We have these desires. So in Genesis 3, verses 12 through 13, we have the occasion here where Adam and Eve are guilty of eating the fruit that was forbidden for them to eat, right? All right, so here's, here's the human nature. So Adam and Eve say, we were hungry. And God, you put this desire to eat food, hunger in us, so not our fault. We had to eat that. See how this works? I had somebody tell me not long ago that marijuana is, uh, and I don't smoke marijuana. I'm not going to smoke marijuana. I don't think you should smoke it. And besides, it stinks. You can smell it all around the fed. So somebody says, well, marijuana was given to us. It's a plant. God created all things. It's a natural thing. And so here we go. You know, you can smoke it. There's nothing wrong with it. We weren't too far from a chicken house. And I said, I'm, there's some natural things in there too. Would you smoke it? No. 
It's ridiculous. Would you smoke poison oak? It's ridiculous. But this is the way humans try to do things to indict God and say that He does something evil. Or he, He's put me in a place where I'm going to do evil and I can't help it. The devil made me do it. Some people say God made me do it. Here's another one, another example here. Letter, letter B. Certain medications are derived from plants but can be illegal or deadly when used recreationally. Right? Because it's true. God put the, the cure, the remedy for things in this life, and aren't you happy for that? And if you look at there's another great blessing, great provision from God, the providence of God. What a wonderful thing. Knows what we're going to need before we ever knew that we needed it. And so through certain plants, we're able to gain a lot of good medicines, good medications. But then what if a person says, well, I want to take it in a recreational form. I don't really need it. It's not prescribed to me, but I'm going to take it because it makes me feel good. That's an abuse of what God has given us. And then to say, well, God gave it to us so I can take it. He put that into the plants, and the plants give us the medicine so I can take it anytime I want to. It doesn't work. Now, I just had a conversation with a medical professional. You see my head? You'll know I've been there. So a, a medical professional, and um, of course, I'm always running my mouth, you know, and uh, but I'm trying to get them interested in a different way of living. So we were talking about alcohol. And um, so this uh, this medical professional said, well, you know, I think it's wrong to take drugs recreationally. You know, just take them anytime you want to and just take them because, you, you know. And then uh, we got to talk about alcohol and, and this person was saying, well, you know, I think alcohol, that's something people shouldn't do recreationally. You know, I think that's just causes a lot of problems, a lot of car wrecks. We see a lot of problems in hospitals and things. We said, right, you're right. Shouldn't be. It should, I, I wouldn't imbibe in it anyway. And so this professional says, well, I only drink when it's for celebratory things when it's time to celebrate. Kind of a contradiction, isn't it? And then letter, letter D here. Oh, letter C. The privilege of, of procreation, for example. You know, we're able to procreate. Uh, it becomes sinful and when it becomes an uncontrolled desire to commit adultery, commit fornication, right? And then somebody would point at God and say, that desire was built into me. I can't help going out and doing this. And yes, you can. Because remember, it's a test. Life is a test. Are you willing to restrain yourself? Because you know that God has asked you to restrain yourself. It's a test. And you're going to fail every time and then blame God? I promise you that won't stand up a judgment. Because God is informing us right here through His servant James that God does not tempt people with evil. We have a choice to make. And then letter, um, letter D here. So accurately understood is God tests us, yes. And things that are built in life do test us. Even your emotions can be a test. Have you learned how to control your anger? That one's difficult, isn't it? Because there's some things that some people can do that really push your buttons, don't they? And there's no place in the scripture that says you can strangle somebody either because you got mad at them. You have to control your anger. That's another test in life, isn't it? So God doesn't tempt. That's the whole point here. Our inward temptations to do evil do not come from God. Don't blame God. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, I control myself. I will learn how to control myself. Might be a good New Year's resolution to take care of. And then verses 14 through 15, let me read and then we'll comment on it. But each one, now God doesn't tempt, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Let me stop right here for a second. There's the picture. Sometimes I go fishing. I haven't been in all my wind, but um, sometimes I go fishing and I'll put my worm on, you know, and uh, good thing worms can't scream. And I put my worm on the hook and throw it out, and uh, I might catch a few fish. But I remember one time, I saw this fish. It was laying over there. It looked like it was that big. It looked like it was that big. And it was in the water, and I threw everything over there. The fish wouldn't move. 
could care less. So after thinking, if I had a little movement, that might be the thing to entice this fish. So I loosely put the worm on the hook to where the worm could still move around and it was probably screaming, I couldn't hear it. So I put it on there and I threw it out there right in front of that fish and that worm was giving it that, fish bit it, I caught it. This is what he's talking about. Our own desires, that's there. But then, somehow evil knows how to entice that desire, to entice what you're looking at, to make it look better, to put it into a position where, oh, I have to have this. See, just that little bit of movement, that little bit of extra dressing up. Something there that will lure you into taking the bait. And that's what he's talking about. Let's keep going. We're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. We're lured. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth to death. So look at this. When desire gives birth, its baby is sin. When sin gives birth, it's death. There's the process. Now here's our problem. We look at the sin, the enticement, we take it without looking at what else comes in. Uh-oh. When Lot moved away from Abraham, remember Lot chose everything that looked good? The plains were well watered, it says like the Garden of Eden. Well watered, plenty of grass for cattle, plenty of room to spread out. And that's where he went. He chose with his eyes. If he had just looked over there, there's a city called Sodom. Can you camp close to Sodom and not be affected by Sodom? And the answer is no. And every day we read that Lot tortured himself, and even uh, Peter wrote about Lot, calling him a righteous man. We read about him sitting in the gate when the angel showed up in uh, Genesis 19. And he's sitting in the gate. Maybe it's because he wanted to be far away from all the things that were going on in Sodom. He was, but the, it says that he was tortured because of the things he saw every day in Sodom. And notice his wife was reluctant to leave. Sons-in-laws, they wouldn't go. Sin is a powerful attraction. And here are angels telling them, you got to leave, it's going to be destroyed. That's us. Sometimes we get so entrenched in sensual things and even sinful things. Think about this. How, how addictive is it to watch certain TV programs? Right? How addictive is it to look at certain things on TV? Not just the sensual things, but um, other things that people are doing just to kind of like voyeurism, you know, to see what they're doing and live through their lives. And, you know, it becomes addictive. And TV itself can be addictive. And I'm not anti-TV. I have one in my house. The internet can be highly addictive. There's things on the internet you just don't need to go there. And it's just a click away. I'm not doing any harm. It's just me and my room and my house. Victimless crime. Is there no such thing? Victimless sin? No. This is another thing that the world tries to teach us. God is saying, don't be enticed by it. It leads to no good. You'll be hooked like a big fish. So the best thing to do is recognize sin. Recognize that desire that's built in you. Recognize what's pulling you and get away from it. If you can do that, you're way ahead of the game. Are we perfect? No. Do we sin sometimes? Yes. But we have an advocate, John tells us. We have an advocate with the Father. And Jesus knows exactly what it's like to live in this life. Now, he didn't sin, but he knows what it's like to be human. So I suggest one of the first things you do when you're tempted is to pray. Pray to God. I think it would be impossible to pray to God and sin at the same time, don't you? Pray to the Father. Deliver me from this. Same, same prayer that Jesus offered. Father, deliver. Deliver them from evil. Remember? We're left in this life. Wouldn't it be great you know, in our human thinking, that as soon as we're baptized into Christ, we're gone. We go to be with God. Problem solved. No, no. See, now we have to prove our faith. 
And we have a job to do by helping others come to an understanding of the truth. Because this is what God has done. He's put it into the, our, our hands. The gospel was given into our hands. And now we have to take it to others. But it's not going to be effective whatsoever if we're not living it. The world's full of hypocrites. They want to see true people of God. Oh, letter C now. Let's go back to our page. Number, page number two, and we're on letter C. Now we're looking at the course and the nature of sin. So we know what sin does. It appeals to our nature. It appeals to our desire. We don't all have the same exact desire. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But recognize, and you know when this is occurring. When it's pulling you to go away from God. When it's pulling you to, to do something you know is questionable, at least. And so that's the occasion where you say, no, i got to back up, i got to back off, i got to get away from it. We talked about this just the other day. Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and it got to the point where she grabbed him, was going to pull him down into the bed with her, and so what does he do? What does the scripture say? He ran away, right? I like the King James. He got himself out. Left his garment, his robe, whatever it was she had a hold of, left it there with her. He just got away from the temptation. Was he a man? Yes. Was she beautiful? Most likely. Was there opportunity? Yes. Joseph chose not to be controlled by that desire. And got away from it. I think that works. Get away from what's tempting you. Now Jesus talked about if your eye offends you, pluck it out. You remember this statement he makes? By the way, there was a girl that actually did that one time. I don't have the newspaper clipping, but she actually did that because she was so worried about something she had looked at. That's not what he's talking about. Not the physical plucking out. But whatever it is that's entering into your eyes that is causing you to leave God or causing you to be tempted to sin, get rid of it. Isn't it better to go through life without the internet than to, than to have it if you can't control yourself to look at things that shouldn't be looked at? Exactly. We made it for a long time without the internet, didn't we? Who's as old as I am? Thank you. We're brave when we ask that question, aren't we? We made it for a long time just fine without the internet. Just fine without cell phones. In fact, some of us remember what it's like not to even have a phone in the house. I didn't have one in our house when we grew up for a long time. Without a TV. We didn't have a TV in my house for a pretty good while. And we live. Let me go back. Paul has a son in the faith by the name of Timothy. He calls him his son in his faith. And I'm thinking, poor Timothy. He didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have a computer. He didn't have a car. Poor Tim. What a sad life. Was it? And isn't he upheld as a great preacher? A great man of God? So maybe we're too distracted by things. Learn self-control. This is James is trying to get us to understand. Learn that we're, we're the ones that allow sin in. It's not God. So an individual is drawn away to pursue sin by their own lust. Tempt is a good word here. And I, so I explained this for you. I go to the Greek and look at it. The imagery is this. is to take something and stretch it out to the point that it breaks. But that works, doesn't it? Because when you're tempted, don't you feel like you're being stretched? You're being pulled? And it's trying to pull you away from God. If I had a rubber band, I'd demonstrate it. But you can stretch it way out. And if you stretch it to a certain point, it breaks. The longer you stay looking at that desire, thinking about desire, the more likely you are to give in to it or let it break you. Wouldn't the story be different if Mother Eve, looking at that forbidden fruit, said, nope, and walked away from it? Would have a different, would have a different scripture. What we'd have, different history. That's not what she did. She kept looking at it. This can make me wise. And here's the serpent over here talking. Satan. It can make me wise. It looks good and I'm hungry. You know. And also, I would be the envy of everybody else. All those things. Why are you holding it? Why do you keep looking at it? Lesson to learn. Lesson for me to learn. Enticed. Lured away. Alright, we understand what that means. 
And when lust is conceived, it brings forth death. It's just like I told you, a, lust has a child named sin, and sin grew up and it had a child named death. And this is where sin always will lead. It always leads to death. I have some scriptures here. In Isaiah 59 verses 1 through 2, what does it say? The Lord's, it, the Lord's hand is not too short that it can't reach out and save. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And his ears not stopped up so they can't hear. But your sins have separated between you and God so that he will not hear. In other words, he will not answer. That's the problem. So sin is a separation from God. Separation. And this separation is death. The Ephesian, uh, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 2, he said that sin is death. Well, anytime you spend in sin away from God, it's death. And the only way we can be made alive again or quickened, made alive, is through Christ. Because we have to have something done with that past sin. Get rid of it. I'm going to the next page here. Uh, page three. By the way, if you need some pages, let me know. There's some out there on the table. I have a few right here, but I want to be sure you have them. Also, consider this. You see, I have a notebook. And if you keep your notebook, then you'll have this handy. You can always go back and reference it. And you might have to teach a class, maybe. You might want to teach a class. Or uh, you might want to look at something that's troubling you. Go back and look at this practical letter that James wrote to gain some encouragement to know that we are not at the mercy of sin all the time, that we can't control it. We can't control ourselves. We can. It just depends on what we allow to control us. So get you a notebook and, and do it that way. And, and I'll help you if you need a notebook and you can't afford one. Or um, I'll even uh, punch the holes for you or whatever you need. We may have a hole punch in the office that we can start. So we have a hole punch in there. I think it's a good way to keep up your papers. All right, so at the top of page number three, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. And this is what Satan is good at. Remember, he is the great deceiver. Deceiver of the whole world, he's called in Revelation. And really, if you look around, isn't the world deceived? They can't see what we're seeing. I mentioned my sister. She's deceived. Here's, what, here's her thought. I'm a good person. So, I'm okay with God. Not covered with the blood of Christ. Or at least, if she was, she didn't stay with it, not faithful to it. That's not going to help her. But I'm a good person. We should all be good. Jesus told us who's going to heaven. Who is it? Those who do the will of my Father who's in heaven. In um, that same place in Matthew 7, in verse 22, there's religious people there. Will you turn there and look with me? Let's do that. I'm going to Matthew uh, 7. Now, it's not just my sister. I mean, it's there's other people that I try to convince. But I see that Satan has, the world has deceived them, Satan has deceived them into all kinds of thinking, almost to the point to where their, their conscience is numb. And it's hard to break that shell. But anyway, Matthew 7, I want you to notice something here. In verse 22, Jesus says, "Many," and this is a picture of the judgment scene. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? Now, what kind of people are these? What category? What is this? These are religious people. Elder Don just told us. He's right. Religious people. Look at that. Look what they're doing. A lot of effort here, probably money, time, doing all these things. And Jesus says in verse 23, to them, then I would declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now the answer is right in front of us. What was their problem? Verse 21. They do the will of the Father. They were religious, but not righteous. Catch it? Religious, but not righteous. It's easier to be religious than it is to be righteous. My sister is religious in her mind. 
but she's not righteous. A lot of people I meet are that way. It can be, it can be turned around so they can understand the difference. But notice, these people in verse 22, they thought they had it. We were doing all kinds of things. But see, it's not that. It's doing the righteous things. Righteousness. Now, there's only one religion in life. Did you know that? There's only one religion. It comes from God. And the word religion, if you do it, uh, etymology here, or do a study in etymology, you'll see that it has to do with being relinked. And you can almost see that in the word religion, can't you? If you spell it out in your mind, religion, relinked. See that? It comes to us from different sources, Old French, Latin. and um, But anyway, the word has to do with being relinked. Relinked to God. There's a lot of religions in the world, but they don't link you to God. I have spoken with a few people where I buy gas, um, and I try to get in as much as I can into some kind of religious discussion, and um, they don't believe in God, uh, the ones that police that I've spoken to. They have a book called the Bhagavad Gita, and sometimes just called the Gita. And so he asked me one day if I would read his book, and I said, yeah, if you'll read my book, you know. And um, so anyway, he's not converted by any means. But I read the Gita, and the Gita is... Um, Events and conversations that take place on the battlefield. It doesn't tell you anything to do with your soul. It doesn't tell you about God. This is what they follow. Hindus and many other people, you know, um, ran across a person who believed in reincarnation. And the idea is you can get to nirvana, a place of absolute bliss, if in every occasion that you've been reincarnated, whatever that might and it might even be an animal, that if you're successful, you reach nirvana. But if you're not successful in the first incarnation, then you're reduced to a lower level each time. So I asked him, I said, how is that a hopeful religion? What hope is there in that? Let me tell you something. When I leave this life, I don't intend to come back. I want to go where God wants me to go and I want to stay there and I'm going to be with God eventually after that because I'm telling you, paradise is better than being reincarnated for eons. What I'm telling you is this, there's a lot of religions in the world, but there's only one religion that comes from God. And to be righteous is more powerful, comes to good, just being religious doesn't do any good. Don't be deceived by this. God doesn't deceive us. God doesn't give us different religions to choose from. He gives us one, and that's the kind of choice I like. Give me that choice. This is the one that leads to life. Okay, that's what I want. Then this is what you have to do to have it. Everything good comes from God. I'm reading verse 17 now. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And I, this is the way I would interpret this. I think I have it on the paper here too. That God doesn't turn His back on His creation. He doesn't turn his back on his promises. He doesn't turn his back on his word. In other words, there's no shadow cast by him turning and walking away from what he said, what he's going to do, and his promises and all that. Because God is absolutely good. And every time something good is in your life, don't you thank God for that? Thank God for that. Babies come into the world. Thank God for that. We're still having babies. We have a baby. Almost. Get close. Zoe's going to have her baby here for a while. Babies are still coming in the world. Isn't that good? People also leave this life, don't they? Some good people. And there's also some that are not really. But remember, God's already given His Word of what we should do. What He will do for us. And how much He loves us. He does not cast a shadow by Him walking away from it. He's the father of lights. In the very beginning, let there be light. And there was light. And ever since that time, we go into the scriptures and we see that we are to be children of light. In Ephesians, children of light, not darkness. That we should walk in the light as He is in the light. Immediately you recognize that light is where God is. That's where the truth is. In the book of Revelation, it says that the Lamb is the light in the heavenly city. 
To live in darkness is a horrible thing. It's to live in ignorance. How many people die ignorant and lost? I don't like that. I'm trying to remedy that, and so are you. I'll give you this story because Brian's fixing to give me the signal. All right. I may have told you this. I've got yeah, to hear it again. The difference in light and darkness. And Jesus said that men do their evil in darkness. They don't want to be exposed to the light. Here's a good story to leave you with. This fellow uh, that I worked with decades ago, he said, I, I want a place to rent. Do you know of a place? I said, yeah, there's a trailer across the road for me, and um, a guy is wanting to rent it. He's got a for rent sign up there. So we went over. It was late at night. I called the guy, and he said, yeah, I'll meet you over there. So late at night, it's dark, you know. He has a flashlight, and he unlocks the door. We walk in. He flips the light on, which you enter into the kitchen. There was a zillion roaches in the middle of the floor. A zillion. The floor was covered with roaches. When that light came on, you know what they did? They disappeared in about 10 seconds. They can't stand the light. It exposed them. And this is what happens with evil. You shine light on evil, it hates it. The Pharisees hated it when Jesus would point out their error. You shine the light of the gospel, you'll find out what you're doing. Let the gospel shine in you. Let it be a light to others because it is attractive to those who want light. Isn't it? Thank you for being here. I know we're almost out of time and I'll give you a chance to get out and do the things and keep talking some more. And thank you so much for being here and your participation. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. It sure is great to have everyone here this morning. We are thankful for your presence. This is the last Sunday morning worship time that we have for 2023. So what a blessing to be here. We hope that uh, Lord willing and He lets the world stand that long that you'll take advantage of the last chance we have to worship on a Sunday evening uh, this evening at 5. Hope you'll be here for that as well. We do have several folks on our prayer list and we'd certainly like to to keep those in our prayers. Uh, before I go into that list though, we're certainly thankful to have the visitors that we have. We do have several visitors and uh, family and things like that, I guess, in for the holidays and we're thankful that you are here with us. Our desire is to worship God in spirit and in truth and we, we do that every Lord's Day. Uh, on our prayer list, we want to keep David in our prayers. Looks like he survived another uh, Mississippi uh, holiday. So that's good to, good to have all them back. Uh, Angela McCauley, she's under hospice care, but she's here with us this morning. So we're thankful to have Angela here with us this morning. Also very good to have Barbara Sintel uh, here with us this morning. Uh, she's going to get some results on her uh, MRI did not show any issues causing her pain other than bursitis and arthritis. So hopefully start therapy soon and maybe have some good positive results. We'll keep you in our prayers, Barbara. Continue to keep Marlon Cowan in your prayers as his health, health issues continue. He he uh, has gotten good news and they're looking uh, at his current status and deciding what they're going to do going forward. He may be just good enough where they don't have to continue with the radiation. And we just pray that that is the truth. But if he has to do that, then we'll pray that it works really well too. So keep Marlon and Patty Cowan in your prayers. Also continue to remember Roy Rose and uh, Christy Johnson's dad's going to be having surgery soon. So please keep that in your prayers. And also Christy's having pain and uh, Johnny's recovering from his shoulder surgery. Uh, Amelia's out sick. Keep Amelia in your prayers. Uh, Loretta's got health problems. She's here with us this morning. So keep Loretta in your prayers. Also, Marva. Marva uh, had some blood pressure issues, and she is at uh, the hospital now in Memorial. So please keep Marva in your prayers, and JL as they're working through that. Lisa Wofford, uh, this is Francis' niece. Uh, she is home now, and she's just got to wait for a while to let that infection clear itself up so she can get that hip replacement redone. So please continue to keep Lisa Wofford in your prayers. Also want to add to the prayer list this morning, uh, Chloe and Damien and uh, Baby Walker. It's a blessing to have uh, new babies in the family. I'm going to try to get that over with before we start singing here in just a little bit. But uh, really proud to have another grandbaby on the way. If you look on the table in the foyer, there's still... Uh, Scripture writing plans for 2024. It's right on my heart, every word. And this is on the book of Genesis. So those are available to you in the foyer. Uh, also, the youth activity sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board for 2024. So make sure that you're able to host a youth activity that you sign up for that. Your first chance for men's breakfast in 2024 is Saturday, January 6th. Be here at the building at 8 a.m. And we always have a great breakfast and good fellowship and and devotion time as well. Also next Sunday, uh, during the evening worship, our youth will lead that worship, our young men, so please keep that in your prayers and plan on being here. And also group one, our middle aisle folks, will be signing compassion cards following that evening worship. Door knocking for January is Saturday, January 13th. Be here at the building at 10 a.m. for that. The 21st, that'll be our third Saturday. Our third Sunday will be our group two, our two outside Rose uh, signing compassion cards. Uh, also, there's a lady, young ladies' day at Subligna Road uh, Church of Christ, and that'll be also on January 13th. There's details about that on the bulletin board. And the Mountain Creek Church of Christ is hosting an evangelism seminar January 21st through 23rd with more information about that on the bulletin board as well. That's all the announcements I have at this time. The proper time, our scripture will come from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That'll be read by Joey Durham. Our opening prayer will be led by Randy Overby and our closing prayer by Damian Walker. 
hope that you will keep your singing voices ready and prepared to sing out to God as we begin our worshiping song. Our first song is number 401, Live for Jesus. We'll sing the first and third verses. <clears throat> Live for Jesus, oh my brother, is reading this morning will come from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Before our first prayer this morning, let's sing number 419. First and last verses of Lord, we come before thee now. <clears throat> Lord, we come before Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity that you have given us to be here on this Lord's Day once again, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the beautiful weather you've given us today, Heavenly Father. We know that you know what we need. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for our church here at Lafayette. We're thankful for what it means to this community, Heavenly Father, and we're thankful for our elders that oversee it, and we just ask Heavenly Father that you would be with these men, give them the courage and the wisdom to keep having the truth being taught here, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your churches throughout the world, Heavenly Father, what it means. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your son that was willing to die upon the cross for our sins so we could have eternal life to be someday, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, at this time we ask that you be with the sick that have been mentioned here today. If it be thy will that they gain their health back and they would be out with us once again, Heavenly Father. 
And Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with those that have lost loved ones and comfort them as only you can. And Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for every member we have here. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for what each and every one does. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our brother David and his ability to preach and teach. Heavenly Father, and we're just thankful for him and his family. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with him during his time of struggle at this time, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Brother Reed and him and his wife as they labor here with us, Heavenly Father, and the things that they do. And we're just thankful for his ability to preach and teach also, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we just ask now we go on through this worship that everything we do will be pleasing to thee. If you keep us safe, Heavenly Father, forgive us of our sins if we fail you. In Christ's name I pray. As we prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, I'm going to sing all three verses of number 408. Lo, in the grave he lay. <clears throat> Lo, in the grave he lay. Wonderful, wonderful song. Thank you for leading that song. We're about to take the Lord's Supper. And let me ask you a question this morning. How close do you want to be to Jesus? We've all come out here today and we've expended a lot just to get here. We've expended our time and our effort 
We bought the nice clothes that you wear and you look beautiful today. We come in our cars that we paid for and pay insurance for and gasoline and all this that and other. We've expended a lot to get here. You've put forth a lot of effort to get here. God bless you for that and God knows that. God knows that you want to please Him and that, that you're trying hard to please Him and you're here. And you know what? God is going to reward you because He's already provided a wonderful thing, this Lord's Supper. Because you came, He gave. And He's gave that to you every Lord's Day of this year. We reflect on this year, you know, and here's the last day of the year. And God has been faithful. He has provided salvation to each and every one who would want it. He's provided this Lord's Supper so we can draw near to Him. So we ask you the question, you know, how close do you want to be to God? Right now, this could be one of the greatest times of this year that you can draw close to God. I know every Lord's Day that you've drawn close to it. But today especially, as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let's draw close to God because of what He's done to us, for us. And He continues to do that. Our God is a faithful God. He gives us so much. He loves us so much. Brother uh, Reed gave a wonderful Bible study a while ago and he let us know very closely that, that even though we've sinned, that God has forgiven. And God continues to provide through Jesus' blood what this represents, this Lord's Supper. Let me read a few verses from Luke chapter 15 to get our mind set also. Here's Luke 15 starting in verse 22. This is after his trial and he's been scourged and been hurt and he's hurt and he's bleeding and he's tired and he's worn out. And they bring him into a place, Galgotha, which is called the place of the skull. And they give him drink, wine, mingled with myrrh, and he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them that every man should take. And it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the superscription above his head was this inscription, Behold, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand, one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, He was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Can you imagine them prideful and doing that, shame and trying to shame Christ? Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, but himself he cannot save. Can you imagine the way that they thought that? Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. There's three hours of darkness. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's return thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread, the unleavened bread, which represents thy body. We pray that as we partake of it, we will do so in a way and manner as well, pleasing in your sight. We thank you for this sacrifice in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's return thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this memorial feast. And right now, as we're about to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed upon Calvary's cross. Father, we're so thankful for this blood that was shed and that we can uh, gain redemption and salvation from it and forgiveness of sins. Father, let each and every one that partakes of this draw close to God, for this is a great opportunity to draw close to you. And thank you so much for this memorial feast. In Christ's name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. God bless each and every one who draw close to God during this Lord's Supper. Thank you. We didn't have that opportunity to uh, give as we've been prospered. And why do we give upon the first day of the week? Because God tells us to. We look in the first Corinthians chapter 16 and it says, Paul said, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. Uh, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So the example is given for us to give upon the first day of the week. And as we reflect back on the week that we just had, we've been blessed greatly, haven't we? So let's give back to God a portion of that, and we'll give it gladly and with happiness in our hearts. Let's give thanks. Father, we're so thankful for you blessing us, and so thankful, Father, for the Every one of us being given blessings much more than we deserve. We thank you for it. And Father, now we give back to you. And we thank you for this opportunity upon the first day of the week to give back. We pray that everyone will give, not grudgingly, but with happiness in their hearts. And Father, we pray that you will give us more blessings this coming week and this coming year. In Christ's name, amen.
anyone's following along their songbook and would like to mark number 382, number 382 will be a song of encouragement after the lesson. And if you would, let's stand and sing number 391, Let Me Live Close to Thee, first and last verses before we have our lesson this morning. <clears throat> In thy field I would will fickle, brave, and true in the fight for the right I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise all the journey through. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me Brother Jesse, you are multi-talented. I notice. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, just a preacher's estimate, real quick. I have I estimate there's 155 this morning, and it could be closer to 200. I'm not sure, but that's what I say. So whoever puts the numbers up, better get it right. It, but it's really wonderful for a preacher or a song leader, or announcer, or anybody to stand up here and see seats that are full. And this is great. It's not my doing, it's your doing, because you love God. And this last day of 2023 is a wonderful day. One of the things is we have the Payton family back with us. We're so glad, and there's others who have been traveling as well. We're glad you're back. David is always an inspiration to us. David has planned out next year as far as sermons and uh, topic for our year and has got his lesson ready for tonight. I don't know how he does it. Just don't know how. Sheer determination and love for God. That's what I tell you. So we're very blessed to have David and his family here. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 17. So we can look at this together. In the middle of a discussion here in this letter that Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he is writing about being reconciled to God. Reconciled is to be made friends with again. And there comes occasions where sometimes, and these Christians at Corinth had a problem, there comes a time sometimes when you have to be made friends again with God because James held us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So in other words, when we become, become friends with the world, we adopt the world's ways, then we have to leave God to do that. And so now he's writing this section of the letter to encourage them to be reconciled to God. In the middle of that, look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, notice that, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I want us to concentrate on new this morning, but notice how we become new. We have to put away the old. And notice that it is if any man is in Christ. The opportunity is available to every person. There is no restrictions. If you want to be in Christ and you follow the ways of God and you could be in Christ, you are reconciled to Him. 
To be a friend of God's, to be a child of God, is the greatest thing that you can anticipate in your life. So that is our lesson. New and improved. And it's interesting, isn't it? I used an old car. New and improved. But isn't that... Some of us look at that and go, well, I'm driving that now. Well, that may be. I'm driving an old vehicle too. But I know that we have come a long way in this life. In just a short amount of time. Now, I'm only only 68 years old. But I can remember at the congregation that we would go to when we were little, um, there was no heating or air. And you would raise or adjust, uh, raise or close the windows as, as you needed. Um, one congregation had a coal uh, fireplace. Another one had gas, and they would try to heat the place with it. What I'm telling you is look at us now. You walk in, it's a comfortable environment. And like our elder was saying, you have a car, you have clothes, you have all these great things. We've come a long way. But personally, for each one of us, as we look at 2024, I suggest to you there are some things that we should accomplish. The reason I chose this topic is because I noticed that Tide on the shelf, the detergent, laundry detergent, every box I think that I looked at said new and improved. And I think it's been that way ever since I've been very young. I did some research. In the 70-something years that Tide has been in existence, it has been new and improved almost every year. I'm thinking, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to be new and improved. And why can't each one of us do that? I suggest that we can. In Psalm 90 and verse 12, this is from actually from the uh, mind of Moses, but inspired. So teach us to number our days so that we may have fire hearts unto wisdom. Now I want you to look at this. Teach us to number our days. I worked with some men who had calendars in their toolboxes and, um, and even our boss, the supervisor in this one shop that I was in, he had a big calendar and they marked off the days. So anytime you looked at their calendar, you would see days marked off. Now, for some of them, they were marking off the days until they could retire. And for some of them, it was just a matter to keep up with what day it is. But this is not what, what Moses is writing here. So teach us to number our days. In other words, he is saying this. Teach us to make our days count. There's a big difference than counting off the days because we want to make our days count. And how do we do it? He lets us know. It's by applying our hearts unto wisdom. We know that we can have the wisdom that we need because we can pray to God for that. James chapter 1. Pray to God for wisdom. And you say, well, why should I do that? Because you can't navigate this life without the wisdom of God and do it successfully. You want to make your days count? God's wisdom will help you with that. You will know what to do in every situation. You will know how to treat every person. I didn't say it would make your life a better roses, but it would help you navigate this life successfully. So I'm suggesting that beginning today and then the rest of the year, why can't we be new and improved? It's a constant process. If Todd can do it, we can do it. There's always something we can do. I certainly can improve. And I know that you would say the same thing. We're looking at areas today where we can improve. And I hope it's an encouragement for you to look at yourself in retrospective to understand exactly what needs to be done. Because the Bible says we've got to make our days count. In Isaiah chapter 40, that's why I have the eagle up here. Isaiah wrote, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You know what this tells us? Age doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we're going to be new and improved. And whether or not we're going to be with God and walk with God doesn't have anything to do with my age. I can get older and I can soar like an eagle. You can soar in 2024. How about that for a rhyme? Put that together. You can soar in 2024. And how are you going to do it? By waiting on the Lord. And this word carries with it a lot of different possible definitions, but one I think that works is is to be attentive and to be patient and to understand that the Lord's ways are not always like your ways. The Lord doesn't do things the way you do things. It's His timing. It's His way. And He will give what He gives. But the wisdom is to wait on the Lord. And that way, notice that word, we can be renewed. Now, I like the word to be renewed. 
A revival is another way we used to refer to gospel meetings. A revival. Why? To revive us. Because you know why? You remember back in 2023, the beginning of the year, and you said to yourself, this year, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to get in shape. I know you said that. I'm going to eat right. You said that. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do, and there's a lot of things you did. A lot of things you said. Did you accomplish those, right? So at the beginning of 2024, we're going to make some of the same things. Ann's already told us that we're going to eat better. So I've got to eat all the cookies. I don't want to waste them, you know. And we'll get, we'll get rid of all the junk food and then we can eat right. I hope eating right includes chocolate. Notice what, notice what Paul wrote to Timothy. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now put in parentheses uh, what the word means. We know what doctrine is, but it's teaching and learning. So the Scriptures are profitable for us. Every time we sit down and read them, we renew our minds. We're improving. And we're reminded. Because those are good for us to learn. And I can't learn, I'm not too good of a learner, unless I have re repetitive things. And sometimes I can remember things from the first, but as you know with your name, sometimes I haven't got those completely down pat either. But that's what the Word of God has given us for. It's profitable for doctrine, teaching, and learning. For reproof, that's uh, conviction, which leads to correction based on the truth. So sometimes when you hear a sermon or you're reading the Bible, you'll be convicted about something you're doing wrong or something you need to do better. For correction, which means actually in the Greek to straighten up. What about that? Your mama and daddy have been speaking Greek your whole life, had not they? You better straighten up, son. So that's what it means. For instruction in righteousness, that means we're trained and disciplined by it. That the man of God may be complete. That means he's lacking nothing. Thoroughly or thoroughly equipped. That means to become what you were taught. In the Greek when you put those words together. Is that interesting? Now look at that. That we can become what we were taught. We are working our ways into improving in Christ. We were taught the words of Christ. The life of Christ. Now we can become that. And to live holy lives. Lives that are productive to every good work. So now I want you to see, we can be new and improved because we are armed, we are informed with the information to do every good work. Now what is it that you want to do in this life, in this next year? What do you want to accomplish? The one thing that will stop us from that is to be distracted. And one of those distractions is fear. And fear sometimes is manifested this way. I don't know how. I don't know how. There's a lot of things that I don't know how to do, but I promise you if I put my mind to it, I'll start learning how to do it. And if you're thinking, I'm afraid because I'm just not a people person, then get around somebody that is a people person. It'll rub off on you just like enthusiasm. And I tell you, when you're around somebody enthusiastic about doing God's will, doesn't it make you too feel a little more excitement and enthusiasm? We have an opportunity coming up that we're going to be out door knocking in the community, people who have moved in and changed addresses and things. It is the most enjoyable thing that we do. And if you want to do that, I would invite you to come and we will put you with somebody who is a people person, somebody who's experienced with this, and you'll see how easy and rewarding this is. And you can learn. And then next year, 2024, you'll say, look at me. I have improved. First, let's talk about this. I want to become new and improved. So how do we become new? The only way we can put off the old, the old man of sin, is to be baptized into Christ. To contact His blood. So we can become new. An actual new person, I might look the same on the outside, but the inside has changed. There has been a moral revolution I have decided I will not live selfishly anymore. I'm going to live the new life that is in Christ. Now in John 3 verses 1 through 5, Jesus introduced to Nicodemus that you must be born again. And it was by water and spirit. I don't need to identify what those are. You know what they are. But you know that people spend a lot of time trying to discount what that is. Now was Jesus wrong? If he was wrong, so was 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 through 23. Because we are purified, we have purified our souls by obeying the Word of God. 
So the Spirit that Jesus talked about is the Word of God. That's how we got the Word of God. Does the Spirit say anything about how to be in Christ? Because remember, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. That's what I'm looking at. I want to become new. Notice Colossians, as Paul wrote to Colossae. Who hath, speaking of God here, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us, that is, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, that is Jesus now, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now look what he did for us. When we were baptized into Christ, we contacted his blood. And what happens? We were transferred over into the kingdom of God, away from the kingdom of darkness. Darkness has a powerful pull. But when we were translated into the great and powerful light that gives life, then we have something wonderful. We have become new because now we have forgiveness. Forgiveness, what a beautiful word. It makes me want to breathe deeper to think about forgiveness. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You say, well, that doesn't say that we're in Christ. Yes, it does. I put on my coat this morning. Am I in my coat? Absolutely. If any man, any person is baptized into Christ, then he has put on Christ. And what happens? He becomes a new creation. Look at the bottom of the screen. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, uh, all things have become new. Now, I told you about in class this morning. I have a past, you have a past. I do not want that to come up in the judgment. And guess what? It won't. The blood of Christ prevents that. The consequences of my past sins will be passed over. We ate this memorial meal. It's because we recognize the blood of Christ gave us the power to become what we could not be on our own. With becoming new, here's a cute little baby. So in becoming new, we think about the same thing. We wash away sins. Now if we wash away sins, this is going to do something to us because it cleans us up. Sin defiles us. Makes us ugly. And what sin looks like on us to God is not a pretty sight. So we have to be washed. Saul was told, told to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And he said, why are you waiting to do this? This is what Ananias told him. Titus 3 and verse 5 says this is a washing of regeneration. Regeneration is to make alive again. To regenerate. You say, you sure do talk a lot about baptism. I have to because people misunderstand it and misapply it. But this is how we become new. We're born again by obeying the Word of God. This is how we purify our souls. And we become innocent as a little child. And when we do that, then we are new. You say, I've got it. Good. Let's go to the next one. We can also renew by returning to God. When you go and get your driver's license, you get them renewed, right? That's what they call it. You renew your driver's license. There was a time when... They would allow me to keep my picture on the new license I was getting. And it got to the point where the new picture I had, or the old picture I had that I kept using, it was like when I was 30 years old, and boy was I handsome. But and So whenever they I got to 60s, you know, they looked at it and they said, you can't use that picture anymore. I said, why? Well, I knew what they were going to say. I had to hurt myself, but it doesn't look like you. So I had to face reality here, right? I wish I could go back and look like that. We would all like to go back and do things, but look at the possibility here. We can renew in this manner. In Ezekiel 18, before people ever saying, once saved, always saved, and all this stuff. Ezekiel lets us know that all souls are His. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. And that the righteous man can turn to wickedness, and that a wicked man can turn to righteousness. But I want to look at the positive aspect here as he closes that chapter. From Ezekiel now. Repent and turn from all your transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. That's wonderful. A new heart and a new spirit or a new attitude. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Do you recognize something here? A great and loving God, our creator and sustainer, says, I do not have pleasure in people who die. It's not death that brings him joy. 
Only if you die in Christ, because actually that's living. He says, I have no pleasure in one who dies. So repent. Turn from your transgressions which you have committed. This is how we can renew. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying that people who have the blood of Christ on them, who are made new in Christ, sometimes get involved in sin again. Sometimes that sin is we just quit worshiping. We just decide we don't want to be here on Sunday. We've got something that we think is better to do. You've got to stop that. God won't accept that. That's not considered faithfulness. We are here when we can be here. We, unless something prevents us, I mean legitimately prevents us. For example, I'm backing out of my driveway and I back up and I run over my neighbor who was getting his mail. Well, I think that day I probably need to take care of his needs, don't you? I might be prevented by some occasions, but we allow certain things to prevent us. Now let me use David as an example. Nothing prevents him. He doesn't allow it. Nothing stops him unless it becomes to the point that he can't do it. And that's what we're talking about. With forsaking, we're talking about I have neglected or abandoned the regular practice of worshiping God. Now, let me ask you something else here since we're talking about that. If you don't want to be here, but you do want to go to heaven, who do you think is in heaven? God's people. Now, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with God's people here, what in the world do you think heaven's going to be? I promise you there's no baseball or football there. It's God's people. We get to be with God and adore Him forever. The prodigal son, notice in Luke 15, verse 30, 20, what did he do? He hit bottom in the, in, the, in the pig pen. Right? There he is in the mud hole in the pig pen. He hits bottom, and what does he do? Looks up. Look where I'm at. I have made a mess out of my life. And remember, he left home thinking he was invincible. Then he finds out he's not. Neither does money make you invincible. But he could go home. He knew his father would take him back. I'm telling you this morning. If you've been away from God, you've been forsaking the assembly, you've allowed everything to distract you from worshiping and adoring God and serving Him, come back. Because He's waiting. Not only is He waiting, He will run to meet you. And you're ready. Your heart turns. You're ready to come back home. Because being away from God, according to the Father in this parable, He said, this my son who was dead when he was away from me. God loves us so much. He's telling us, even though we may have sinned, even though we may have abandoned Him, He is still looking for us to come home. Returning to God then is living. Real living, real life. And that's how we're making our days count. So what does God do? He calls for us to repent. It's a word that is in fashion, it is in vogue, it is vital every day that we live. We always remind ourselves. And see, the problem is, a lot of people are unprepared to meet God. I know this. I'm trying to convince them just like you are. And we will try to do that as we... As we knock doors to show them that we are God's people, we want you to be a child of God like we are. We want everybody to have the promise of heaven. And Jesus doesn't want anybody to perish. We also become new by improving. Now, I'm over into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you'll turn with me there. When I read this chapter, I was thinking, this is the perfect chapter to me, at least it contains all the things that I would want to be able to attain to. And verses 1 through 17. So if you read this with me, it'll make sense. In the first verse, he talks about abounding and excelling here. Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort that the Lord Je through the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Notice what he's saying here. We've learned how to walk with God, we know what it is that pleases God. But now he tells us to abound in this. It almost sounds like I'm doing what I can and he's saying, do more. I understand. Because when I look at this word abound, it means to excel and exceed. I can get better at what I'm doing. You say, all right, how can I do this? How can I possibly do this? For those of us who say, I'm just not good at meeting people. You can learn how to meet people. It's easy. Or you say, well, I'm studying all I can. Are you really? And how deep are you studying? Now, I've kind of shown you here, and David does this a lot for us, and we're wonderfully blessed by that. 
is to get a word and then show us what the Greek is so we understand what that word is. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, in uh, Philippians 3 and verse 20, it says, for our conversation is in heaven. That's not, the word is lost to us here, conversation. The word is citizenship. So if you go to the Greek and you look, you see exactly what God is trying to get us to say. Now he's saying, abound, exceed in your good works. Verse 3, abstain from sexual immorality. Why? Because purity honors God. Let me read verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, you're being set apart, your holiness, you're being a saint. That you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, and sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who know not God, that one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of such, as we are also forewarning and testifying to you. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. You're reading that for yourself, you see? When we abstain from sex and immorality, it honors or it values God because we're following Him instead of the world. The world thinks nothing about sexual immorality. Nothing about it. They don't think anything's wrong. And yet God says, abstain from it. Peter says, it wars against the soul. So we're fighting a battle here. I'm not going to let the world win. Now the world's going to come and it's going to defeat us defeat me in a few battles. But I'm going to win the war. Because the war has already been won for me. All I've got to do is to be sure I attain to that victory that Christ has got for me. Notice this, verses 9-10, through 10, that we should love one another. And what? Keep abounding in that love. Now one thing you find out about this congregation, we love you. We love each other. I feel the love when I walk in, just like you do. Verse 11. Aspire to live quiet lives. Notice what he says that. What does that mean? Mind your own business. You've got plenty of business to mind without trying to mind mine or somebody else's. This is good for us to learn. Notice it's biblical when somebody says, mind your business. Because I may have been infringing in their business. But however, it's not always spoken in the accurate way. And verse 11 also. Learn to work with your own hands. If you want something, work for it. Paul said in another occasion to uh, Thessalonica, he said, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Learn to work. Because working is good. Because idleness leads to trouble. Learn to work. Find something to do. I have noticed on almost every business they have a sign up that's been up so long, it's beginning to fade, we're hiring. We can work. It may not be the most elaborate job in the world, but we can work. And there's satisfaction with working to have what you have. Satisfaction to work, and when you gain some monetary value here, you can actually give back to God. How wonderful God has been to us. And then verses 13 through 17, to live in anticipation of Christ's return. Anticipation of it. What if we did this every morning? We started this in 20, 20, uh, 2024, and maybe we've already been doing this, but we can intensify that as every morning think, I have another day to serve God. And this might be the day the Lord returns. When the Lord comes back, a week before that, there won't be a day where you wake up and go, my hair's tingling. My back's chilling. Something doesn't feel quite the same. There's something going to happen. I just feel like it. You won't have that. He comes like a thief in the night. It'll be a day just like any other day. And then it happens. This is why Paul is writing to them, live with anticipation of the return of Christ. If I lived every day and every week, like this could be the week, this could be the last week of earth's history, I would live differently, wouldn't I? It could be, couldn't it? That's the whole problem, it could be. Joshua 1 verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. The Lord is with us. Number four, here's another thing. Good thing here for 2024. We're looking forward to this new year, how to be new and improved. And one thing is, is to get busy, and that means to go forward. Why? Because you can't go backwards. If you go backwards, it's into sin. And that puts you in jeopardy. So you've got to go forward. There was a point after the children of Israel had wandered some 40 years, 
that God finally told them, quit circling, quit walking in circles, go forward. Where are we going, Lord? To the promised land. You notice when they got there, they had to take it. Started with Jericho. There's always work to do. So let's go forward with confidence in prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16, we approach the throne of grace with confidence or boldly that we can obtain help in time of need. If you haven't been as regular as you need to, commit in 2024. Get your life right, be in the righteous state, and be praying to God. Great things are happening because of prayer. Great things are happening in this congregation and have happened because of prayer. We could name a lot. In 2024, we need people who will be in the place of prayer. Every Christian, be there, be praying, set time to do this. And more than once a day, as much as you can, pray to our great Heavenly Father. He wants us to pray to Him. He wants to hear from us. And great things have been wrought because of prayer. The next thing, let's forget our past. I told you everybody has a past. Well, let's forget it. And the best working definition of forgetting is this, is don't let it stop you going forward. Because I can remember things from my past, so I can't have completely forgotten them, but I don't let those stop me going forward because God's already forgotten the past. Satan comes to you and says, hey, you remember what you used to do? Say, look, Satan, get away from me. God's already forgotten those. You can forget them too because I'm not letting it stop me from going forward. Third thing, continue to transform. According to what Paul wrote to the Romans, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do I renew my mind? A new mind. A new person. A new word. A new mind. A new way of doing things. A new attitude. New hope. New way of living. The fourth one. Leave the old behind. This is one of the subjects here in 2 Corinthians 5.17, wasn't it? Behold, the old things are gone. Old things have passed away. I am not the person I was decades ago. And my past does not define me. I am going to leave that life behind and I have left that life behind and I'm going forward. And I'm always entering into places I haven't been before, but with this new confidence that God has given to me, I know He's with me and I can handle any situation that comes up. And then this last one, look beyond the affliction. Paul called affliction in this life a light thing. For this light affliction. And if we can look beyond the affliction and see heaven, then we can endure affliction. I have my aches and pains too. And if you're looking at my forehead, you know I have some pain today. <laughs> I have plenty of stitches up there. But I couldn't wear a hat this morning, so here you go. You have to see it in all its glory. Well, we look past the affliction because we know heaven is there. And no matter what amount of things we get attacked with in our body, our disease, our, our injuries, and any other thing that can happen to us, heaven's there. God is there. He hasn't forsaken you. And the promise of heaven outweighs anything that we might have to endure in this life. The Bible says so. And you can't keep reading the same chapter and expect to go to the next chapter, can you? There's no way. And sometimes we do this as humans. We say we want to be new and improved, but what we do is we keep on reading the same chapter of our lives and we're stuck right there. we got to go to the next one. Turn the page. Let's go. Let's go with God. Make every effort. What i got on the bottom screen. Make every effort to make peace with everyone and to be holy. This is what the Hebrew writer said. Without holiness, nobody can see God. I want to be new. You want to be new. And I want others to see that newness in us and that renewed and that revival because 2024 has the potential if God allows us to have a full year. It has the potential for things to change. It has the potential for us to change, for others to change, and for us to have a greater influence on the world. Listen, the world is ripe right now. It's ready for harvest. It's our task to go out, to be brave and courageous, and with a renewed spirit, a new attitude, is to try to sow the seed in the lives of every person. Why? Because that's what happened to us. And because of that, we are new and improved. To be in Christ is the greatest place to be. And to enter into 2024 in Christ is the greatest thing you could accomplish. This morning, are you willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin? Not baptized to join the church of what's happening now. 
But for the remission of sin, this is what Acts 2.38 says. You can't have your sins forgiven without the blood of Christ, but you have to understand what the baptism is for. And you can do that if you're willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God so He can hear. And you would do that because you have repented of your sins. And you do that because you were informed to by the Bible. You heard the Word of God and now you believe it. If you're willing... If you're willing, we are certainly encouraging you to do that. We are so happy to have you here with us. And we want you to be in Christ for 2024 as we stand and as we sing. that excellent lesson. I hope that we're all energized and ready to renew ourselves for 2024. Best thing to do getting ready for 2024 is to be back here at 5 o'clock today. We're going to have another great lesson. Looking very forward to it. And the other thing that we need to focus on that we focused on in 2023 also is evangelism. We want everybody to have the chance to go to heaven. It's not a place that we want to keep to ourselves. So as we sing this closing song before our closing prayer, let's sing it like we mean it. And let's hope that God will lead us to someone today that we can help get to heaven. Lead me to some soul today. Holy and righteous Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so humbled and privileged to be able to come before your throne this morning, this day, this first day of the week that you've given us, Lord, to come together, to encourage one another, to build each other up in the faith, but also, Lord, to sing songs of praise to your holy name, to offer prayers, knowing that you hear our prayers, Lord. And that, that you, the God of the all the universe, would be mindful of us. We thank you, Lord, for each and every opportunity that you give us to, to serve you and to spread the good news. And we do pray for one soul today, Lord, and each and every day that we might come in contact with that would be ready and willing to accept your gospel. 
Lord, we, we want all souls to, to hear your word and to accept it and to obey it so that we can all be in heaven with you. We pray, Lord, you help us to do all these things. We pray that you'll be with us now as we go to our respective places and, and bring us back at the next appointed time. In all things, Lord, we give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.